are you? I'm Lisa from Lisa. Italy. Oh, cool. Yes, from Padova. Awesome. Okay, great. Nice to meet you. Who are nice to meet you too. Who are you? I'm in Augsburg, Germany. Okay. Um, are you at the University of Padua? Yes, I am. I'm a um, postdoc there. Oh, cool. And yeah. what, what are you studying? Uh, my field is that of intercultural education. Uh, great. Yeah. And are uh, you writing your dissertation then? Oh, no, I, I, I already wrote my dissertation. I'm okay. a postdoc, uh, so I'm, I'm a researcher, actually. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And what are you especially interested in? Uh, well, my PhD dissertation uh, was about teacher beliefs on cultural diversity. Mm -hmm. And now I'm involved in uh, projects about uh, unaccompanied minors and also about, of course, after an after school program that is going on here, it, it will be going on here in, in Padova. Hi, hello, hello, Carla. So, hello, Tom. Hello, Lisa. It's so good to see hi. you both. Hey, Carla, hi. How are you both hello. doing? I will let you continue with your conversation. <laughs> All right, cool. We're just talking about Padua and what Alisa is into. And yeah, yes, like I'm, I'm trying to introduce myself as I'm new here. I stayed uh, at the UCLA a couple of years ago. Oh, and wow. um, Marjorie Oriana uh, asked me as a visiting scholar. So I had the opportunity to um, participate in a uh, um, qualitative da data session about the B Club. Mm. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Cool. That's really cool. Wait, are you from Italy? Yes, I am. And you came to our conference, didn't you? Yes, I, I, I just jumped in and out because it was like... Um, like um, uh, really late here. Um, I was uh, on Friday evening. Oh, okay, afternoon for you and evening for me. Actually, yes. So, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. No, I saw you and I thought it was pretty awesome um, that you came in and got to meet the network and you know some of the people. Hi, John. Good morning. Hey, John. Good morning. Hi. And Lisa, it's funny because um, I'm also pretty new to UC Links. Um, and by new, I mean like three years, a couple of years. But I think um, one of the things that Mara told me, uh, you know, when we were discussing my position and within the network, um, she says, Did you drink the Kool Aid? No. <laughs> Did you drink the Kool-Aid? Because like you have to, I think, you know, at first it's really hard to kind of understand what UC Links is, right? Or to like envision what UC Links is. It took me, it took me a minute. Um, but once you, once you really start putting like all the connections in and seeing the work that's being done, you kind of go, oh my God, this is a really valuable network, you know? Mm -hmm. And to be part of something, a, a network that has all of these wonderful scholars like worldwide, it really, sometimes you have to like take a step back and take a breath, but I think um, all of the work that everybody's doing is valuable at every level, right? Like yes. some sites work more um, with just children and some sites are actually trying really, really hard to include the parents because they know that without the parents, right? That like it's, it's, it's impossible to do the work. And I think one of the things that the pandemic has taught us is that it is, imperative that the parents are involved and um so you know and every site transition differently and you know um everybody has like different connections everybody works differently but at the end of the day it's like a collaborative network that's mm -hmm. here you know in case you're having issues with something and you need to bounce ideas off of somebody but i think uc links with this history it's been alive for like 30 years um 
with its history, you know, it's positioned in a place where we are in the world right now to mm -hmm. really be the lead uh, in this transition that we're experiencing in the world, you know? And so I think you're, you're in the right place and we're lucky to have you. I can't wait um, for the connections that are gonna be built with you and through you. So we're happy to have you. Thanks a lot, Carla. Thank you. Uh, hi. Hey, Mara. Hi, hello. Sorry. Hey, hey. Late to my own party. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, I'm so glad you could join us. I know it's a holiday for you and you too, Tom, right? Is it, don't you guys have a day off today? Yes, we yes. do. Uh -huh. That's it. Well, it's very kind of you to join on your the evening of your night, your day off. Did you already talk about your holidays? Did you guys have good holidays? Oh, well, actually nothing really special here as we are still in the lockdown. Yeah. So yes, yesterday I was, uh, in um, I went to my family and we got the lunch together so it's something really italian traditional mm -hmm. <laughs> way to, to spend the easter actually yeah mm, that sounds really nice sorry and is are things locked down in in augsburg too tom mm, it's so like everyone's afraid there's a lockdown coming but it hasn't really happened yet okay people are hoping like with uh you know all the um vaccines now that we can just kind of like <laughs> it's like the young people are just like partying in the streets like it's over you know oh, God. So it's like oh wait a minute you guys yeah I don't know. and especially because they're the ones who haven't been vaccinated yet yeah mm -hmm. so yeah are you guys like fully vaccinated like carla and mara i am All right. the two doses already yep yeah, I'm waiting for my second one this um, Thursday. I'm excited about it, but not so much excited when it comes to the side effects. Many people get sick. Do you get sick? I didn't. No, I was oh, totally fine. Lucky you. Yeah. I'm, I'm concerned about that. My partner got the one dose only. I mean, they, mm -hmm. I think it's a chunk, I think. Next day was miserable. Had yeah. to quit working and had to go back home all day because like yeah. fever and chills. And I'm a little bit afraid of that. Actually, I had my appointment for Friday, but I was like, I don't want to ruin my weekend. So if I'm gonna, <laughs> if I'm yeah. gonna feel sick, I'm gonna feel sick on Friday. No Saturday. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I was supposed to get my second dose. One of the appointments that they offered me was a couple of days before the conference, and I was like, Oh no, that, <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> uh, but I'm glad you didn't feel sick. That's good. Yeah. 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 I'm excited. I, I can see that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. I'm a little bit concerned with a uh, back home. Mm -hmm. Back home, especially in my hometown, is getting awful. Like people uh -huh. are not taking, a, you know, like the suggestions. People are going crazy, and people are afraid that after this break, uh, last week was the break in Colombia, like Semana Santa, and basically. People are not following up uh, the restrictions, and people are afraid that now, after the break, uh, cases are going to skyrocket. Mm -hmm. So, I'm hoping that will not be the case, but that's a yeah. little bit disappointing. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's we're at this, yeah, just trying to outrun the virus with vaccines. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I hope that you all stay well. For sure. We have Lisa here. Have you already started telling everybody about um, what you're doing? I think it would be great to hear from you, Lisa. Uh, well, I, I tried to briefly introduce myself to Tom, actually, because I and also a little bit to Carla. Um, but yeah, so um, Nice to meet you again. I'm, I'm Lisa Vugno and I'm a postdoc at the University of Padova. So um, my field is that of intercultural education. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Marjorie Oriana uh, hosted me uh, for a month. And 
in that occasion, and I had the occasion to participate in um, a qualitative data session about the B Club. So I I went to uh, I went through the um, the B Club, and uh, after that, okay, um, I I'm involved in a after school. Um, uh, program here that is about to start. We are looking for funds, and uh, more or less here, here I am. So Marjorie suggested me to join the conference last uh, a couple of weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I got in in contact with Mara, and uh, we are well. Actually, I'm I'm looking for. Um, knowing more for references and for being part of the uh, UC links. And of course, I, I would like to collaborate and, and more or less, that, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Could you tell us a little more about um, like where like tell us about like who your partners might be in the community and how okay. this might work. Like, will you be teaching an undergraduate course? Yes. And, and okay. uh, yeah, and if there's any specific questions um, that you have that um, and that maybe John and, and Tom, I know could, could introduce themselves in, unless you spoke with them already, you know, so you can get more of a context of, of what other people are doing too, in case that's helpful. Yeah, so, well, uh, our main partner is a teacher that he, he is working in a primary school uh, in a neighborhood here in Padova that is really um, multicultural. Uh, so uh, it, it's, quite, um, it's quite different from, at least from LA. Uh, first, because Padova is a really small uh, city in the uh, northeast of Italy, close to Venice. Um, and here in Padova, in Italy actually, we don't have only, um, um, we don't have uh, people with only one um, migrant background, but uh, um, people are coming to Italy from more or less all over the world. So uh, there's no, um, it's different uh, from LA where the most part of uh, migrant people are Latinos or, or Korean. And uh, actually um, they are more or less spread all over the city. Uh, and this particular uh, neighborhood that is called Stanga, it's uh, quite uh, different because um, a huge part of the um, population, population there is, uh, has a migrant background. So it's uh, um, a quite difficult um, uh, neighborhood and the school is uh, where Fabio that is our partner and the, the teacher who is uh, in uh, in charge of this after school program uh, the school there is always uh, involved and uh, he's always trying to um, um, to create um, projects and situation to to foster um, in order to foster integration and dialogue and uh, and so on. Uh, so um, Fabio, uh, that is uh, the the teacher, he asked for our um, help and uh, because we are working, we are yes. Um, the, our research group help. So uh, me and prof the professor who is supporting my career, we are involved in this um, after school program project. And uh, moreover, there are many uh, different organizations um, coming from the community around the, the school. So uh, the, the, the main one is a foundation 
that uh, is um, that, that, that usually um, organize and um, run uh, different uh, uh, workshop inside the school. Uh, so yes, we are the three main partners, but we are looking also for uh, let the um, the partnership become a little bit big, <laughs> uh, bigger. Okay, and yes, uh, what else? Um, yeah, more or less. That's oh yes, and. Uh, we would like to focus on STEM, S-T-E-M, yes, okay. And uh, the idea is to uh, run the after-school program dur also during summer school, the summer school break and the, um, the other holiday breaks during, during the 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 year in order to um, let the children have a, a place to be also uh, when the school is closed actually because one of the main problem is that uh, if the school is closed there children have not the a, a place where to, to to stay and they are more or less Mm, alone actually yeah because the most part of the uh, parents they are usually working during the day so it's something also useful to uh, prevent um, uh, dif more difficult situation let's say okay great and if you have any question great. please uh, sorry it sounds exciting. It's a good fit with UC Links, I think. There's so many parallels. Like I, when you were saying this, stuff, like when you were telling things, I was yeah. like, wow, there's a lot of parallels there. Yeah. That, you know, we, we have heard. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Do um, you have an undergraduate class already that's, um, that's working in, in neighborhoods or is that something that is common or is that something that you would be developing that's new or what's the yes, it's something support? it's something totally new also because here um i, I don't have a, a course yet at the university my my but my professor he obviously obviously do uh, does uh, but uh, uh well um, uh, our department, well, uh, he gives lessons to the student teachers and uh, here the um, path in order to become a teacher is quite uh, strict and is the Ministry of Edu Education that uh, planned everything. And there is a kind of internship, but the student teachers, they, they have to do this internet internship during the normal school hours, times, okay? So this uh, way to, to involve undergraduates and, and student teachers is quite new. So we are trying to develop and to to, to find a way in order to involve them in, in the after school program. And the solution we in the in we define is that uh, well they um, they have to also to, to write a kind of portfolio, a kind of thesis about their path. And um, we think we could involve them uh, in, in an experience in order to, um, uh, to, to write their portfolio and their thesis on, on these. So in, see, yes, if, the, if we will have the funds, I, I will probably the person in charge of uh, following them in this uh, path. So yeah, um, I'm also uh, thinking, uh, I would like also to have your suggestion about how to train these undergraduates.
before going going the uh, in the after school program. Yeah. And oh yes, something I forgot to tell you is that I am I am myself a, a pre-primary and a primary teacher. Of course, I, I'm not working as a as a teacher now because I'm at the university. I'm doing research at the, at the university, but I worked. Uh, I I thought uh, more or less seven or eight years. Uh, during my master degree, my, my yes, my degree and master de degree, and yeah, yes, <laughs> that's that's it. And I, and I will probably have. I really hope to have a my, my course next uh, academic during next the next academic year here. In Very cool. Um, Lisa, what kind of research is your professor into? Um, his field is that of intercultural education too. Uh -huh. And we are working together um, um, on teacher beliefs about cultural diversity, unaccompanied minors, and also we are starting now something new with um, pre-primary schools, and um, and also nurseries. Is that uh, mm. okay? Yes, because here in Italy uh, we. Uh, uh, there's uh, this new um, topic about uh, trying to put together the um, nurseries and pre-primary school in order to have um, a, a unique path for children and also for family, of course. So uh, we are collaborating. Uh, uh, we are collaborating with um, some uh, with a region uh, in order to develop. Uh, Mm, the, the quality of these uh, um, services and also well uh, in Italy there are different kind of uh, pre-primary schools and uh, of, um, nurseries because they can be um, public pre-primary schools uh, um, we, yes we've got the prime uh, public or private pre-primary schools but also the um, the, the cities can open and, and run a kind of uh, semi-public uh, primary school. So we are trying to, to um, you, you, I don't know. Yes, we are uh, collaborating with different um, organizations in order to promote uh, the, the, the quality of these services for, for young children, yeah. Cool. Yeah, Mara, don't you think the first thing probably is to think about the course at the university side for, for talking right now? just as an open discussion. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, right, because I heard Lisa's, Lisa's question was about how to train the undergraduate students. And that's um, like what Tom is saying for us, that happens through the undergraduate coursework. Right, is that what you were saying, Tom, to use yeah. that as a vehicle to answer that question? Is that, right. would that be helpful for you, Lisa? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> Tom or John, do you want to do you want to jump in? Because it it at I mean for UC Links, the 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 answer that you that you will probably get tired of hearing from from me and everybody maybe that you speak with is that it really looks different in different places, right? So there's no like one undergraduate Recipe. course like <laughs> this is way the way we're doing it so so the the benefit of of talking with so many of the different people here is like you'll hear how how it can be done in Augsburg with Tom and and John can tell you how it can be done um using their various models in Santa Barbara and then Carla and I can talk with you about you know all the various ways that it's done um from all the people who aren't here this morning because we have that kind of bird's eye view from uh the statewide office but I'll hand it over to um, 
Tom and to John to, to explain more how it works on their campuses. And I also, I made a note stock um, that we usually have for our um, virtual office hours. And so that's in there. And I was just taking some notes um, while you were talking, Lisa. And, uh, and then there's also spaces for people to include their own uh, contact information and any notes, any resources or anything else they want to add here. So um, feel free to, to write in there as well. Okay, oh, thank you. Wonderful. See, see who's joining us. Who else can <laughs> lend their perspective? Oh, good. <laughs> Yay, it's Kathy from Whittier, another rock star. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. I think she's probably getting her sound all. Kathy, just to catch you up, um, we're talking with Lisa's joining us. I don't know if you met her at the conference or not, um, but we're um, hearing about the UC Lynx work that she's developing in Italy. And she just asked the question, um, hi. Uh, she just asked the question about um, how do we train these undergraduate students? And so we were just diving into kind of the, the university course. And so I was hoping that um, you and Tom and John can help give her some insight. And I just put the note stock in the chat. And if there are other questions that other people have that they want to be sure to get to, let's um, put those in the chat or, um, or include them in the in the notes doc too, so we can be sure to, to get to everybody's questions. Cool, Tom or John, you guys wanna dive in and give Kathy a chance to catch up a second? Yeah, I can, I can, I can share with, um, with Lisa a little bit about what we do here at UCSB. And we have like, it's basically, I would like to, I mean, I would say it's kind of like a tradition when it comes to the connection in between the undergrad course with the programs. And, and that's super important uh, for the grad student coordinators and the faculty directors, because that's the opportunity we get to bring, um, and I'm sorry I have my camera off, I'm doing like many things at the same time, I'm multitasking. <laughs> um, I think like the connection is super important because that's the space that we have to get closer to the undergrad. Uh, when I was doing my master, which I shared previously at the UC Lynx conference about how do undergrads engage and have an important role in these after schools, um, in this community-based after school programs, um, I realized how important it is to get closer to the undergrads and give them like uh, to make them feel valued and their contributions are foundational to these uh, programs. Um, not to say that the kids are not important to us because they're extremely important, but some, most of the research that has been done in, in, in after school context are focused solely on those who are being the main um, um, character or the main uh, role in this after school, which could be adult, which could be the kids, which could be like whoever is on the quote and mark student side. Although we don't like calling them student because they're just co-learners as we are all learning along with them, right? Um, so that's why I decided to, okay, but what about the undergrads? In the Youth Links community, undergrads are foundational. I mean, if we don't have undergrads, if we don't have them like um, understand what is the community-based approach about, then the whole thing is gonna fall apart, right? And if you don't have the, the undergrads involved and active in their activities and, and sharing the same vision or philosophy of our programs, then it'll be very likely that one, it won't work, or if it does work, it might work in a very traditional way, which is not what we're actually looking for. We want them to step aside from the, uh, you know, teacher, student being only like one directional, only one direction instead of, instead of being a, a two side or two way street. Um, and that's why the undergrad course becomes important. One, because the faculty provide like the insights of, uh, which is usually uh, a UC Link faculty, like 
you know, we have three, at UCLB, we have three of those and they take turns every quarter to teach the course. So there is that. So every single faculty shared the same vision of a community-based approach. Second, it allows um, frequent uh, check-in with the undergrads. So we as grad student coordinators, we meet with our undergrads every other week, just checking in with them, socially speaking, pedagogically speaking, and, and also like assigning them like, okay, this is our expectation of how we want you to contribute to this. And also allowing them to bring like, you know, funds of knowledge, whatever you're good at. Um, I remember when I coordinated LIFI, which is an environmental uh, literacy program, I didn't even know, I was a coordinator and I didn't even know much about the environment. And it did work out just because we allowed the students to bring whatever they were good at. So since it is a community, people are not expecting you to know it all, even though you are quote unquote in charge of the of the group, right? And and that's what it takes to build a strong community, to be open about uh, what other people can teach you instead of being focused on, hey, I need to know it all and I need to provide them the, all the knowledge they need in order to be successful. Um, and that was super powerful. And and we provided the students an opportunity to use whatever they were good at. So some students were not good at gardening, but they were like, hey, I'm good at art. So they created lesson plans, like activities for crafting and connecting that with the garden we had at the at the program site. So um, some of them were motivated by their uh, own life experiences. So the population we serve are like mostly Latinos uh, here in Santa Barbara. and. So most of the undergrads who served as a facilitator, they were also Latinos as well. And they were like, you know what? What really motivated me to join this course is because the population were serving. Um, I can see myself in them because I was one of them. And I wish I had someone like, you know, like this kind of program to be there for me when I was growing up and an after school organization, like, you know, like the Boys and Girls Club and organizations like that. So that's another factor that kind of like motivated the underwear to jump in and be part of this, have this approach in close contact to the, uh, with the kids. So there is that. So if I had to highlight uh, a couple of things that are foundational for the training is one, being in, checking in constantly with the undergrads to provide like the inside and an understanding of the philosophy of what community looks like and non-traditional education. This is like totally informal. We're not following up uh, as Script, scripted curriculum is more about like having some sort of structure but allowing a lot of flexibility within it and, and I think that's the key because we want to follow the kids interest and also like allowing the undergrads who are important as well to have some agency and freedom to do their thing um, and also um, how important it is and I'm gonna talk, um, and this is basically me. I mean, I'm, maybe some people will not bring this up, but in my opinion, and it has worked out for me before. Well, COVID is a little bit different, but in face-to-face, -face, um, something that I really enjoyed besides the actual program activities is bonding with the undergrads in a social, emotional way. I always found myself impressed. Like I have, let's say, I have around like 10, 12 undergrads every quarter. And obviously we're human beings, it's hard to connect with all of them, but I always, always, always had a group of four or five who were like closer to me. And they were like asking me stuff about, hey, how, how is grad school like? Is it really hard to get into? I heard that it's super difficult, you know, that they're like curious about like grad school and stuff like that that you can provide to them is also an outcome of the program, in my opinion. Like besides serving the community and the kids that are part of those, uh, after school organization is also like creating the bonding from the other end that most people do not really consider because, and it's okay. I mean, the kids are important for sure. They're the, the core of our community serving. But if this is a community, then we should not forget about the other side because the other guy become that channel, that bridge that connects our philosophy with the actual practice. Um, so that's why I value about that. Um, is that kind of like personal encounter with the undergrad and they coming up to me after the program is over and they're like, hey, would you like to grab some dinner or let's grab a couple of drinks and let's talk about this. I would like to know how's the process to, to apply to grad school. 
And then they had they asked me a question about how is what is research about, and that kind of connection is what sometimes again this is in a face to face environment motivated some undergrads to come back again, uh, for the next quarter and volunteer again, um, and just to take independent units, which is basically volunteering at these programs as facilitators as co learners, and. And that was super powerful to me. Like I remember that at the last quarter, we couldn't have many uh, at the last quarter. So spring quarter, we couldn't have um, as many undergrads from the course itself because we carried like eight undergrads back from fall quarter and winter quarter. So we only had like four instead of 10, 12, that which is the regular number we get every quarter. So to me, that was super important. And I have spoken too much. I hope that that was helpful to some extent to you. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I agree with everything you just said, John. I think a lot of it overlaps with our site too. So I'm from Fifth Dimension at Whittier, Cal Whittier College. Um, <laughs> so we don't run on a course space, we're uh, work study. So students have from the government or from the college, they receive an allocation of money that they can work to gain that money. And then they can use that for personal, like for books and food and clothing, or they can use that towards their tuition. So ours is a little different because it's not so much like by semester or by um, quarter and it's not um, credit space right now, it's, it's all pay. Um, we do have some students who choose our program as a like site for their practicums and child development or for their field work that they need to do for education. But most of our students are, are paid. Um, but I agree with everything that John said. I, I think the only things I can add um, that like, even if they just, they're not even different, they're just add on top of what, what John just described is even, I think about um, like the professional development side of working with community and not in the sense even of like trainings and things like that. But I think what I've been noticing a lot more, because I think it's something I went through myself, is when you're someone who loves to work with community, it's very easy to burn yourself out. You give, 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 give all the time. And it's like learning how to balance so that you are you are not burning yourself out to where you can't give anymore. Or that doesn't become this kind of like you can't love it anymore because it's such a it's like tainted by the by the stress. So I think something I've been doing with my with my undergrads lately in the past year or two has been really having kind of conversations or workshops or just practices that help them learn how to how to self care, how to set boundaries, um, how to say no to me. So, you know, it's like, if I say, does it, can anyone take up this project? It's like, you can say no, everyone can say no and I'll figure it out. Like I will, we will find a way, it's not your problem. And I think, cause I think sometimes people who are attracted to community work are people who always just love to give and will sacrifice everything and will be like I'll be there no matter what I have to wake up at 4 a.m tomorrow but I'll stay till midnight helping you clean and I think that's obviously really good and and that passion is what keep you know it's it's an it's it's uh, addicting and it, it inspires but in the long run as we all you know develop by their families or have longer more stable jobs or you know just grow and, and need to do other things you need to be able to say no to certain things or know your boundaries. So I think that's been something that's been really important with our training lately has been helping them identify how to say no. Um, you know, how do you balance your life? How do you maintain schedules? How do you even in a sense of at least for our demographic too, we have a lot of first gen students. So even just helping them navigate, you know, being the first one in their family to go to college and also have a job. So a lot of times they'll be stressed because it's like, I want to do all these things, but my family doesn't understand why I have to be here and I can't be with family um, all the time, how I used to. So those are some of the things that I've been focusing on for the undergrads, more of that kind of real life application post, post fifth dimension. And not just like in the um, learning about how to be a teacher, how to be an educator, but more of just as them, for them as people. Um, the other thing, and I think it adds also to what John was saying, and something I talk about with my friend a lot, she's an engineer, and she often mentioned that emotional intelligence is something that we should be teaching in schools. <laughs> she was a lot of times as an engineer, you know, she'll come to me and like people don't have the skills on how to critique or how to engage in conversation and disagreement or how to how to handle someone who's stressed like how do you in a professional environment like how do you help someone who's who's overwhelmed and, and freaking out right like there isn't that like not everyone knows that and that has it naturally so a lot of things i've been doing with my undergrad is also that end of just practicing with each other so being being 
like vulnerable in a professional setting, right? Because it's also, again, boundaries. So it's like learning how to work as a team. Because how John said, if, <clears throat> if it's the undergrads that carry the program. So if they don't do it, if they can't function as a team within themselves, 80% of my job is then going to be managing disagreements and little scuffles and drama and like people are hurt. And, you know, that's a lot of where your energy is going to go rather than focusing on the activities. So I think helping them learn how to be team members, teammates, um, is a big piece as well. And I think that's what Carla saw some of that at our retreat a little bit, I think. I don't know. The second part, she saw more about our program. But in the beginning of our retreats, we do once a semester. Um, that's a lot of the focus. It'll be talking about where we want to grow, where we think we're, we're yeah, building community. It's, it's that. It's making sure that they feel close enough and trust each other so that they don't get lost, lost in the sauce. As, as, as the youth say, I think. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's a big piece. And then the last one I just thought about was supporting the student, uh, the undergrads themselves, because I think John mentioned a lot of the um, struggles that students can have, right? Like unlearning a lot of stuff. And, and that can be hard, you know, it can, you, your defense systems come up, your defense mechanisms of like, no, but I think I'm right because X or you don't want to seem wrong or seem stupid or, or seem like the only person that doesn't get get it. So I think a lot of times it's a lot of it's working on my end to make sure they feel supported by me and feel safe with me to make the mistakes. Like I tell them often, I don't want you to hide a mistake. Like, please don't think you have to hide it. Like you accidentally completely went off off the what we're supposed to be doing with the children and you just notice now or you deleted a file from something that's really important, like from the smallest to the biggest, from the, from from interacting with the children to something that's just kind of like technical. Don't hide it, like just let me know and then we will help you. That's the point is to help you. It's not to shame you or to make you feel bad or to be like, you're fired. Um, I had one the other day, a student who, she's been working with me now for like two years and I forgot something that happened. Oh, they had a student in the Zoom and we have we have like our, our like levels of how to handle children who don't really wanna be there. Um, you know, they're, they're just either like they're yelling and they're, they're, they're not staying muted. They'll yell randomly just to interrupt or they'll spam the ch comment section. And um, so that we came back at the end of the day for a little mini meeting to regroup and just talk about anything we need to talk about. And they mentioned, you know, well, we, we like we had to send them out to the waiting room because they just weren't listening. That they were just being really rude and were, they were like looking at me almost like, was that right? <laughs> And I was like, well, I mean, I think I, I trust you if you tried everything, if you tried talking to the child and like giving them options and letting them log off and it still wasn't happening. Um, you tried everything and you let them know. And she mentioned, she's like, okay, good. She's like, just, I just, I was worried. Like, you know, I don't know, like I'd get fired because I did the wrong thing. And it's stuff like that, right? So I'm like, I'm not going to fire you even if you make a mistake. We'll have a conversation about it. We'll we'll see what went wrong and what to do next time. And we'll handle whatever fallout there is of talking to the family. Um, I was like, I'll fire you for yelling at a kid <laughs> or being rude or mean or bullying them. But for mistakes that you're making while you're learning, that's not something that's going to be like, you get an F, I guess, if you teach a class, right? Or that you get fired in my, my case. So I think that's something I was working with undergrads is just being their support system so that they can, they feel comfortable coming to you with the, I just don't get it, or I don't know why I can't blank, or I feel so confused by X. Just, I think if they're not able to do that, it can be really easy for them to pretend that they get it and then just move on without having really learned. Which I think a lot of little kids do in school too, right? You fake that you know math. You're like, yeah, I totally get two plus two is four. And you don't, and then you go your whole life not knowing. Um, or maybe that's just me. But, you know, I think, <laughs> I think that can be very common as a kid. And I think it even happens as an, as, as an undergrad. So those are ones I thought of um, hearing John speak. Thanks, Kathy. Tom, did you want to chime in too? Or, and Lisa, did you have any other questions too? I just want to make sure that you can get everything answered. Maybe Tom can answer multiple questions. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Lisa, do you have questions so far? Oh, no, no, thank you. Go, go, go on, please. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think John and Kathy really talked about the heart of uh, UC Links activities. Uh, the teamwork's very important. And I always stress teamwork and creativity, which I think work well also if you have like, sounds like you have younger kids. 
So they're probably going to be like really creative. The thing that works for us here in Augsburg is, um, yeah, we do the creativity and language learning through film and music video, which is maybe, you know, we have like 11 to 14 year old kids. So that might not be so good for the young kids. But um, I mean, what works for us is planning these music videos and films. Uh, the university students with the kids is like totally the important thing. So the thing that always works is just small groups, like two or three university students working with uh, six, seven, eight kids. Video, and then they shoot it like, you know, we're there once a week. So it's about like 12 weeks maybe. And then at the end, we have a party and show all the films and music videos. And it's really cool because the kids are kind of nervous, you know, about how that's going to look. And then it's up on the big screen. They're kind of like, you know, movie stars for a couple of minutes. And I have a really good um, site coordinator, Anastasia. She was at the UC Lynx conference and she's musically very talented. So she's doing a great job with the kids. And I think there's a good connection between music and language learning that might be appropriate for very young kids. And I'm trying to think of like with young kids, if for us, it always works, you know, breaking the kids up into small groups with university students. I don't know if that would work too. I would think probably it would with very young kids. So your kids are like four to six years old. Is that right? Uh-huh. And yes. maybe like language learning, I think they're probably pretty, flexible with language learning might be a possibility and you know maybe like marjorie does how it's like the kids are learning language but they want to like uh, you know also share their expertise which they have so much of and the thing i wanted to ask you was um you know it sounds like you would probably be the site coordinator the university student who's like does what Kathy is doing and what John does. And then, I mean, you might already have a course with your professor that's appropriate if you're in, you guys are both into intercultural learning. So it's kind of just like a practical thing about the numbers, how many kids and university students. Yeah, yes. Well, uh, they will have the course with my, with my uh, professor, of course, about intercultural, intercultural education, because it's part of the curriculum uh, in order to become teacher. So if I understood correctly, what uh, you are suggesting to me is to take care about your relation with the undergraduates as the first point, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, yes, we, we will for sure start small. So I, I think uh, um, we will have more or less uh, three or four undergraduates in order to, to, to start this kind of uh, pilot. And after that, we will, we will see. Um, what I'm thinking uh, about is that their, um, their training is um, particularly focused on uh, formal education. So um, uh, I, I totally agree with the importance uh, or the, um, the importance of um, create uh, as a side coordinator, as you call it, a, a really good relation with the undergraduates. And I, I will for sure uh, focus on it. And I think, I, I really hope to have also the opportunity to, um, uh, to, to, to plan some uh, meeting, uh, meetings only, uh, the, the four or five of us in order to create this kind of, of a relation. And it's something really important to me too. But uh, what uh, may I ask you also some uh, suggestions about uh, the um, informal education and the um, community? Um, yes, the, uh, the 
uh, Catherine was uh, talking about the professional side of working with the community, because in my opinion, is something that they are not really familiar with because they did the path in order to become teachers. And of course, it is something really important also as a teacher to, to learn how to work in team with other teachers and also how to work with the, in connection with the community. But I have this feeling that it's like a little bit, um, not, in, not really focused in, in their normal training. And it's, uh, something I, I would like to um, to give them uh, to yeah to improve a little bit uh, start thinking about it before joining the after school program and, and possibly uh, foster and improve during during the after school program it's something I really like to to focus on yes I think informal learning is really you know, very powerful form of learning. It's really uh, important for a lot of what we do. And it's also a like, huge research field. And I think that's, you know, that is common even here. I mean, in, in California and Whittier, um, a lot of people, you, you can tell who's gone through them only the formal track, right? They know how to make lessons. They know child development, they know theory. But then when it comes to talking to a family member of the child, they freeze up or when it comes to how to deal navigate kind of the more community side they freeze up it's very awkward they feel nervous so I agree with you it's a whole different set of skills to learn and what might be helpful too is even having them submit even if it's not for the class but just for you as like as part of their job or like the field work end um uh, submit maybe to you like a reflection on what they have done in community that could help you know what the what the experience level is so if you ask everybody you know submit to me a paragraph that tells me um, if you've done any work in the community and what kind what was your role and that could help you know you know maybe you have two really strong people who have already done this a lot and you have eight people who this is their first time ever engaging in community you can then it helps you plan you know, maybe the two can help mentor the others, like, you know, who are the people that you can kind of put more work on at the beginning. Um, or if all of them are brand new, you know where to start, you know, from the very, from the ground up. And, I, and something I've learned with people who haven't really done hands-on community work, um, what I've learned is just having a general, like just the do's and don'ts, that helps a lot. I think people like structure, people like to know what can I do? What shouldn't I do? So especially with hearing it's four to six, like, um, you know, what is allowed and what isn't? And like, the, just the basics of that, I think, because a lot of times people when they've never done community work, they're nervous of, I don't want to step out of, I don't want to do the wrong thing. So then they end up just not doing anything. <laughs> they won't interact with anybody. So even with the community itself. So like, you know, what times can you enter the building? If you enter the building, what do you wear? What can't you wear? Um, what protocols are there? Who do you talk to if you this happens? Who do you talk to if that happens? Um, where are the bathrooms? So just that can ease a lot of that anxiety at the beginning so that they're not so caught up in just the logistical things that they're not present because then they won't be present with the children. So I think for that end, it takes a lot of just lay it out very black and white. Say, if you have any questions, let me know. And I think getting a feel of what experience they do have will be helpful to you. Sorry, Carla, I saw your <laughs> Carla, did you have your hand raised? Yeah, actually, um, Lisa, I something that you said really, like, really sparked thoughts in my head. Um, intercultural education. Right? I don't know that I've heard that before, and maybe we know it by some other name. Here, yeah, I was, I was going to ask a, a little bit about the terminology because I did work in intercultural education back home in Colombia. And my first master thesis was focusing on development of intercultural competence in higher ed students, you know, being aware of diversity and all that. But I was not fully sure because I know that there are different ways to understand interculturality. So I, I, I wanted to ask you about that, like what's the approach you are having? Because the approach I'm having I do have, when I, in, because I still do research with some colleagues back home in Colombia, is based more on the European Spanish approach. Like we base our research in many scholars from Spain, um, but it may differ from how you guys see it. So I, I was curious about how you see interculturality from your end. 
Was that your same question to Carla, or did you have a different question on that? Well, I, I, I mean, I looked it up just to see what the definition was that was given. And, um, and, and I think the reason it resonated with me is because of all of the diversity that it talks about. And so, and to me, to me, as an anthropologist, like diversity is what makes the world like so beautiful. And so like, I kind of wanted to know more about how you, your, your, like your sight sees it, but also because I think that if that, like your lens is this inter, you know, intercultural and diversity like that, I think it fits well with what the work that UC Links does, especially because of like what Catherine and John were saying. I mean, like I have my own relationship to like the work that UC Links does, right? And like um, a lot of what they said resonated with me as well. Um, I'm an undergraduate currently. Um, so a lot of my work that I've been doing with it, um, with UC Links, you know, has a lot of the same things that Catherine and John have been saying. But like, for me, I didn't know that inter, whatever intercultural thing was like a, a thing. So now I'm like, wait a minute, this is a thing. I think I want to go study with Lisa, Lisa and Padua because like, I, you know, I'm, I want to know more because I, I, I really do. I really am a big believer that, you know, um, diversity and approaching, approaching things with diversity in mind makes a big difference, not just to the undergraduates, not just to the little kids that you're working with, but to society as a whole. And I think that there is something to be said about approaching theory, approaching education with that lens of you're coming in understanding that you're going to be diverse and that you have to be accepting of, you know, multiple, multi multi multitude of people. So um, can you tell us a little bit more? Uh, okay, it's a little bit hard to, to say it in a few words, actually, because it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's a, a, a huge field of, of study. Uh, anyhow, um, so uh, yes, Carla, you got the point. The diversity topic is the, the focus here in the uh, intercultural education um, field. So yeah, um, the, the most part of the uh, of these studies uh, are related to how um, you understand diversity and culture. Uh, and cultural diversity, of course. So uh, the idea is that culture is not, and it isn't something fixed, but it's something um, in in evolution and something that that changes uh, in relation with the people you 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 meet, the the places where you where you stay or where you live. So it's something um, really uh, in a way dependent on the environment you, uh, you where you live. And um, so uh, intercultural education in the um, school, um, um, at school, uh, it's something really important in Italy as uh, it's um, the, 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 ministry, uh, the Ministry of Education chose more or less 20 years ago. Uh, the intercultural education has been chose, uh, chosen as uh, the, um, the, the way in order to develop the um, curricula at, at school and um, it's a kind of political choice. So differently than other European countries, we don't have uh, special schools or special classes for uh, migrant children, for example, but they are, uh, they are in, in um, in the same classes of their peers, starting from the very beginning. And of course, the language acquisition could be um, a topic, an issue, but uh, the uh, studies, studies also, uh, or literature also shows that um, they, in a way they learn 
um, Italian as second language uh, faster. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the idea is that um, um, doing um, being a teacher that uh, um, focuses on intercultural education means uh, foster diversity and um, um, how can I say it in English? And let everyone uh, take care about diversity and respect diversities, all kind of diversities that the, uh, there, there are in, uh, in classrooms. So for example, even if there are not uh, children with a migrant background, um, intercultural education is something that has uh, to be in the teacher's head in a way. And um, also because it's not something that have to be, uh, has to be done because, uh, because there are children with different cultures or um, uh, different backgrounds, but it's something uh, that have uh, to be thought in, in, in a transversal way. Does it make sense to you? Okay. So more or less this in, in, few, in few words. I don't know if you have um, some question more, Bridget. No, I think you did a great job explaining what it is. I think, um, mm -hmm. Do, should, shouldn't we do? Do we have something similar in the United States, Mara, Tom, John, like that? That approach, you know, it seems to me like such a beautiful way um, to I, do education with like migrant children. I think you know, yeah, and even I, even beyond migrant children, like yeah, I totally agree, with you, Carla. I think like when I first moved here, I tried to find like something very similar because what Lisa just explained is basically the same approach that we do the research when it comes to intercultural education back home in Colombia. And the government is barely is starting to push to include that as a foundational core, like a foundational core to the curriculum in public education as well, like being aware of diversity, uh, being aware of, you know, like respecting tolerance and, and adapting the curriculum to make it more like suitable for different cultures as well. But of course, every country sees diversity in a different way. So like, for instance, in Colombia, we do have a lot of diversity, but the diversity we see in Colombia is not the same diversity you, we see in the U.S., right? The U.S. is extremely diverse and it's, it's too different to be compared. Um, I have heard many people when it comes, but most of it has been uh, in the field of uh, applied linguistics that you cannot take language as a, apart from culture. They're all together. So they do research in something called intercultural communicative competence, which is like being aware of like the biases and, and the differences in culture and how culture itself can shape the way we do communicate. And, and it's kind of like interesting because I noticed that for instance, when I lived in Spain for like uh, two, three months back in 2015, even though we spoke the same language, culture make a whole different dynamic of the communication. And you can still have miscommunication because one terminology, one verb, one word might, may, um, might um, mean something different back home in Colombia and that would mean something different in Spain. So like being aware of culture itself and how you should not make assumption that you should like, let's say behave, talk, express, like your body language should be the same just because you have the commonality of like language. So it goes beyond merely like language itself. It goes like, you need to, you cannot take culture uh, for granted when it comes to communicating with people. That's one of, that's one of the aspects that intercultural uh, communicative uh, competence talks about, which is interesting, but, but I would say like the equity to intercultural education in the European, or I'm going to say Spanish because I wouldn't dare to say that that's translated into other contexts, which is the one we use, uh, has um, 
if they do have something similar here in in the UN, maybe there is, maybe there is, but uh, but I can see that that's more like split in different areas. You know, like like for the people that uh, fight for social justice, equity, access. So I can see like the 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 research itself is there in its culture education in the way I see it and in the way Lisa sees it. But I would say that that might be found if you deconstruct intercultural education into different aspects. Like when you talk about racism, that's for intercultural education, like how you prevent racism or how you make people be aware of their own biases. And when you talk about tolerance, when you talk about the cultural diversity, when you talk about language itself, when you talk about different beliefs and finding an opportunity in diversity to learn or become a better person, a better cult cultural being, you know, like there are like different aspects that are part of the intercultural uh, education framework. But I can see that, and I may be wrong, that it is, it can be found, but if you deconstruct it in different areas, that's how I see it. I just wanted to jump in because I know that we're um, at time. We usually set aside an hour and we usually go more like an hour and a half. And I'm always happy to stay longer, but just wanted to make sure that people feel comfortable jumping off whenever, whenever it works for them. Lisa, it just um, if you have time and you don't have to, if you need to go, please, please go ahead and go. Um, but you said that when you came to LA um, to work with uh, uh, Marjorie, that you saw a difference between like what, you know, like what you study and what Marjorie does like the, in the, um, how, how was that? Like, what was that difference? Like what, like what, what was the difference that you saw between the way that, that intercultural education is taught in the US versus what you do in, in Padua? Okay, um, I probably uh, did a mistake because it's it's not a difference in terms of uh, approach. The difference is about the context, because because for example, here in the neighborhood where we would like to start the after school program, there is a, a context of. Um, uh, are you familiar with Bertovec and the super diversity? Um, okay, a anyhow, uh, it's a super diversity context. So in every, um, in every class, there are uh, ch Italian children, of course, but there are also children coming from more or less all over the world. And if I recall correctly, um, Fabio the teacher told me that there are uh, 28 different uh, nationalities. Yes. So that's <laughs> is to give you the idea of a super diversity context. So um, in a way, it's really different for teachers to um, to to do school, to do the, the, the normal activity, their normal activities. But on the other hand, it's something really. Um, really good for the language acquisition because if you have uh, a really huge um, number of different cultural and language background they uh, children in a way they have to use Italian as a lingua franca so they learn the, the second language a little bit more faster as they are all in the same in the same situation and also um, is uh, it's a little bit uh, different to have um, groups that uh, that uh, cultural groups inside the class or inside the school. So there is not that much actually the situation of having the i don't know the latinos children uh, playing together and the italian children playing another group and and so on so it's a this is the kind of difference uh, i noticed between the two contexts uh, 
but the uh, the approach it's something really similar and i think that they are really next actually thank you you're welcome <laughs> Lisa, does Marjorie know that you want to start up some UC Lynx activities in Padua? Okay, cool. Yes, yes, she obviously know. And we started uh, also with Mara some uh, connection uh, on this, but uh, yeah. So they wrote a proposal like it <laughs> and uh, and we got we Marjorie and I helped with some letters of support and and um, I tried to connect Lisa because they were actually talking about um, assessment strategies as well that they had to demonstrate and so I shared what uh, the California UC Links programs um, have to do for their annual reporting as well and so really tried to throw as many various resources as we could. Thanks. Yeah, so we'll see. When when are you supposed to hear back from? Uh, I have no clear idea about okay. this uh, detail, but I, I will ask for for it. I, I, think... I think the funding could come as early as June, though, right? So it would be very soon. Yes, yes. Uh, if everything goes well, maybe we will start in September. Okay. So, yeah, let's see. That would be great. Um, yeah. And did you say that that there with the with Fabio is there an existing after school program at the school? Yes, they already started um, a kind of um, pilot, but we didn't participate it on on this uh, on this pilot so they started of uh, the uh, I can't remember if this year uh, or well a little bit before the COVID uh, and, and the, the, the pandemic so uh, after that everything has changed so yes but uh, we didn't collaborate uh with them collaborated with them during this first experience and so and no undergraduates were were involved yeah great wow um i had some thoughts on um the question about informal versus formal um learning and um I put also just a link it both in the note stock and in the chat. I don't know if you saw it, but um, there's on the UC Links resources page, we have um, links to various course syllabi. I don't remember if I shared that with you before, Lisa, um, but that can give you an idea of how the various courses are structured. Um, but I think just in addition to all of the things that um, John and Tom and Kathy were describing, like the actual structures that actually help support the undergraduates um, and help, you know, quote unquote, train them to work in the after school programs, it's really providing um, the theoretical underpinning for the students. That's what the university course does. And, and the courses are, are all you know, can be different, um, you know, like, I know that um, the course that um, at Santa Barbara, I, you know, has slightly different um, foci each quarter, um, because there's three professors involved. And so usually each one takes a turn teaching it each quarter, um, and they might have slightly different syllabi. And the same thing, um, you know, some of the courses are in uh, education, you know, and in a school of education. And some of them like um, Alessandra, who um, I guess couldn't be here this morning, but she's at UC Irvine. She's also from Italy. Um, I don't know where, um, but uh, she's in the math department. And so their, their program is, one of their courses is actually in the math department. And, um, but the idea is that, that the undergraduates 
they are immersed in whatever theories it is that are being taught. Usually they're <clears throat> rooted in uh, Vygotskyan um, kinds of theories where, um, you know, the undergraduates and the students are, as everybody was saying, are co-learners, right? And the roles of expert and novice are very flexible depending on the activity. And there's lots of focus on um, joint activity and the development of joint activity. And the structure of the course then is providing all of those theories for the undergraduates to learn about and to talk about in their course, and then to go and kind of apply those or see those in action in the after school program. And another common vehicle that I think most of the programs use are field notes. And, um, and we have field note templates too, if, if you wanted to see those, but it's a way for the undergraduates to, you know, to get really good at describing kind of their general observations of the context and the setting and the focused observations um, in a, you know, in a objective way, you know, mm -hmm. what the activities were that day and then to provide their reflections also, which usually serve as a way to um, integrate the, what they're learning in class with what they're doing in the after school. And so for some faculty that those field notes also comprise um, data for their research as well, drawing on what the undergraduates are, are learning and what the, um, what's going on at the site locally. Um, so those are other kind of common tools or structures that are, that are used in the undergraduate course to help support their learning um, along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just one more thing about the formal and informal. I think it might be interesting if you haven't already to talk about this more with Marjorie because um, Marjorie tried for at least a year and maybe more to integrate um, the UC Links program within the teacher preparation program at UCLA. And so um, I would say the majority of our programs are not in teacher preparation programs. I know at Santa Barbara, they tried that as well. Um, and the, I think, and I'm probably oversimplifying, but I think one of the reasons that, that, that this isn't more common is that tension between the formal and the informal um, activities. And I know, um, I believe when I spoke with Marjorie about this before, it was kind of a struggle to get the, um, the teacher candidates to, to see the value maybe in a way of, of, the, of the informal activities, or they, they really just didn't have a schema for how those fit in to like the school day, to their training. I think that the, I think that the pandemic is really kind of blowing the lid off of that and really opening up opportunities um, for teachers, especially to see the connections between the informal and the formal and to see the connection between the in school and after school, right? Because in hybrid or virtual, like there's barely virtual, you know, after school doesn't mean anything when it's all the school day and it's all from your living room or your bedroom, right? Um, and so I know just like in our programs, um, like uh, Glenda and Adrian, um, who work with one of the programs at UC Berkeley, <clears throat> their school partners came to them um, after the pandemic started and said, we need your help and we need you to move from after school to in school. Like we still want you to do this after school stuff, but we need your undergraduates to be working with us during the school day, during class time and helping us to lead breakout groups and all sorts of things. And so the, um, I'm, I think that this connection between formal and informal um, may hopefully be making a, a more permanent shift. Um, and, and just for, um, I think this is everybody's first time hearing this, but um, I'm also in conversations with, in California, we have two public university systems. Um, yeah, I wish, yeah. Um, one is the University of California and one is the California State University. And there's more California State Universities. There's like nine youth University of California and there's maybe, I don't remember how many, there's maybe 20 something CSU programs. Um, and the, the California State Universities do the vast majority of teacher prep throughout California. And, and 
I'm in conversation, um, the chancellor, the direct, the president of the U of the CSU system used to work in a UC links program. And so we're now in touch trying to figure out how UC links and, and that public um, institution can partner as well. And um, one of the areas that we're exploring exploring is the teacher preparation pathways and, and just that um, making, seeing if informal learning can become more integral to um, teacher preparation as well and potentially um, seeing if there might be some uh, faculty who are interested in piloting some UC Links programs within a teacher preparation program. So it's really timely, I think, that, um, that you're working on this. And I think it's something that we just have to really keep kind of pushing on the edges right now um, so that as a way to, to make um, move you see move after school out of the margins and as a strategy really for learning that can be in school or out of school. Yeah, yes, yeah. I think it's very exciting. Any other like last questions or were there other topics that people wanted to talk about while we're here? Well, Mara, thank you again for all the effort in the conference. It was an awesome conference again. <laughs> and I then, you know, you know, it'd be cool if Lisa could come uh, next to next year in uh, in real time, so to speak. Definitely. Oh yeah, I just wish next year we'll be in person. I'm crossing my finger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because a lot of people um, in the feedback, um, people definitely wanted to be in person, but people were also definitely thinking about ways that we can maintain some uh, virtual space so that for the people who aren't able to travel too. Yeah. Sounds yeah, I think that should be crucial. So that would allow like people, like especially like, international partners, which may, I mean, not all of them may have the opportunity to come in person to join the conference anyway and be part of the conversation as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really appreciated the richness of the perspectives. You know, we had so many people from different, you know, time zones and, <laughs> and continents and everything really able to to participate really fully. It was, I thought it was fantastic. I just want to say that um, Dogecon, the, uh, I don't know why I always chop off his name, but um, you Dogecon. know, the, yeah, the young man that's working with uh, Santa Barbara and um, we were in Gather Town and he, he said, he, he told us, he said, you know, I've been to a lot of conferences and I was worried because it was going to be like this, this big chunk goes, and this is the best, best conference I've ever been to. It's like, it's like nothing how I thought it was gonna be. It wasn't boring. Like it's completely different than I thought it was gonna be. And I thought to myself, yes, I'm gonna keep that forever because, because you know, it, because it means a lot, you know? And also, you know, like behind the scenes when Mara and I were talking about, you know, how to, how to make this happen. Like one of the things that I told Mara was like, okay, look, we don't want to be talking heads. Like I hate going to those things where it's just a talking head. You don't engage. You don't, you know, you don't, you don't get to, to say anything. And so, you know, thank goodness for all the work that, you know, was done to ensure that the conference was going to be something very dynamic. And I think it was, even though it was through, you know, this medium, it was still very dynamic. And so, you know, I, um, I'm appreciative of those words because it, it makes a big difference. I think, at least for me, it does. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it wouldn't have been as successful as it was unless, uh, you know, A, we had wonderful practices to build on, you know, we, we just, I think Carla and I tried to take the approach, like, let's just highlight and try, you know, and actually embody like some of the practices that people are developing around the system, which is, makes it more fun. Um, you know, so we had A, we had great work to build on, and B, we had fabulous partners, people who 
were willing to dive in and give everything a try and, and show up and, and give it their all, you know, it wasn't, you know, you know, a conference can be a bunch of talking heads and a bunch of passive listeners, but, you know, we didn't have the talking heads and we had very engaged participants. So I think it just kind of changed the whole, the whole paradigm and experience. So, but that's, you know, it, I think we lived up to the way that we, the way that we work, right. With our kids, you know, um, you know, nobody was sitting around and being passive. It was all a bunch of <laughs> active, agentive learners. Yeah, and that's what I like about this. Like, even in person, like, even if you're just like, you need a break from the main room and you can just walk out, even a conversation in the hallway feels productive because it's all oh. about like, you know, like, it's community. This is not traditional. This is not about like, hey, like, how do you organize your structure and a scripted curriculum? It's never like that. It's more about mm -hmm. like, hey, but have you tried? So the more emotional and social the conversation it is, the more they're contributing to your program. So, I mean, I, I feel like, and I said it before, it feels like a family gathering and just like trying to solve something and, and improve um, something, which is the program, in this the programs in this scenario, but it never feels like, hey, be careful what you say about this because this guy is famous and he has the absolute truth about how to build community, you know? This is all about we all together figuring this out and learning all together, learning from our mistakes, learning from other people's mistakes and trying to make the best version of our program every year. Yeah. That's what I, that's how I see it. Yeah, that's great. I loved it. I remember you saying that at the end of the conference, John, like it feels like a conversation in the living room. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate you guys coming and, and showing up for these office hours too. I mean, I really think that these, you know, these conversations are so helpful for me, you know, that we have instead of just having it once a year or, or Carla and I having one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with you all individually, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to get to, um, you know, really chop things up with you all on a regular basis and see how things are, are growing and, and especially, you know, I really appreciate everybody lending their, their knowledge and two cents and experience also to Lisa, you know, it's always fun to see these programs in these positions of starting, you know, I think everybody is probably, you know, is definitely rooting for you and like, oh, yay, <laughs> let us help in any way we can, you know. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot uh, once again to Tamara and of course to Marjorie and also thanks uh, to you for uh, your your really your really interesting suggestions and I will go through all these materials uh, in the next weeks and. Uh, I maybe I, I will email you if I have the some some question. Is it fine with, with you? Okay, wonderful. You, um, I put your names in the maybe John and um, Tom in the note stock. If you just want to stick your um, emails okay. in there, good. I put them in. They're on page. Uh, looks like four. Um, and Lisa, did you get the uh, email about this office hours um, on the listserv? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. Well, I let got me... one coming from, from you. Okay. Let's see. Because I, um, I will make sure that I thought that I had had you added on there already. Oh, but maybe not. Okay, I don't think I did. So I will, um, I will make sure that you're on the listserv also. So you'll get these and you could also then post to the listserv, um, you know, and just say hi and, and, you know, an update and any questions that you have also. Brilliant. Thank you. Great. Well, it's good to see everybody. Fun to see your face, Tom. We haven't seen your face. We've seen you all masked up for so many months now. Uh, there's nobody at the university, so I didn't have to wear it. <laughs>
Oh, right. Because you guys are all on break. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's nice to see you, the rest of your face. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Mara, for creating this space and oh, that was yeah. a very productive conversation. I was happy. Yeah. This is very refreshing. Very nice way to start the day. I know. It really is, isn't it? I think so, too. <laughs> Great to All see right. everybody. Have a good week. Mm -hmm. Bye. We'll see you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.